meeting is being recorded. Hello, everyone. Today is July 26, 2023. This is the Kubernetes Data Protection Working Group meeting. Uh, so I think today um, we, we, we will have an update from Karen and Ivan, um, the Seek Auth, right? You guys went to Seek Auth? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Seagulls meeting. Okay, so you guys want to share anything so I can stop sharing or you just want to talk about it? Oh uh, yeah, we, I can share some slides. Okay. Okay. Can you all see my desktop? Yeah. Okay, so I, I pasted the link in as a comment. Okay. The agenda, yeah. All right. So uh, last week we presented the current design proposal, right to Sigot, and uh, we got amazingly good feedback. Uh, essentially, yeah. Essentially, you know, they told us that mutual authentication can be achieved between two arbitrary Kubernetes services using the token request and token review APIs. Oh. Uh, Interesting. Okay. Yes. yes. So it's possible, you know, and the and the token we get back has enough information, right? The user information field there, so we can do a subject access review. You know? So, uh, you know, essentially to illustrate, right? They had no problems with all these parts of of, of our proposal, right? That, that there's a sidecar which hides the store, you know, the SP, and 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 the sidecar uh, talks to the SP via Unix socket, and you know the application uses direct grpc and the fact that they are tls and not mtls of course when we came down to this part right which was you know there's a set we had this whole session construct to solve the m part of the tls issue right they said uh -uh, don't do this use token request and token review apis well hold on that wasn't the only reason for that part right like the other reason to have a session was to obtain the endpoint that you should be talking to for any given pair of snapshots right yes and and that part is still remains that's over here the advertising of the of the endpoint that's over where remains. i can't see your mouse but... okay oh sorry yeah it's, it's all right I, I see it now okay yeah I, i'll get to it in a few and i'll get to it in a okay. few slides right mm -hmm. yeah but you're right yeah, so we don't need this token review token. You know, we use the token review token uh, request APIs to solve this problem, right? Essentially, what has to be done is the client obtains an audience scope token. Now, this was something new for me too. It's been around for a while after I dug into it, but I, it just did not surface for me. There's a thing called an audience scope token where the audience is not the Kubernetes API server, but the server or some other entity, right, which you're talking to, not the Kubernetes API server. Um, then the client would pass the security token. And of course, in our case, also the, the snapshot namespace, et cetera, right, is part of the gRPC parameters. And then uh, the, whoops, where did I go? The sidecar, right, will authorize, sidecar is authorized to actually do an authentication check and to authorize the gRPC, just like we had before in, in the webhook, et cetera. So, you know, it really solves a lot of things. So essentially the synopsis of what we'll be doing now would be, you know, as before the backup application will directly connect to the CSI gRPC, the snapshot metadata service and bypass the Kubernetes API server. But backup application must first use, get the token from a token request API to get the, the right audience scope token for the CSI driver concerned. Then the, the sidecar, or oh, it shouldn't say session anymore because it's not a session. Okay. The sidecar is available to front the SP metadata service, right? And its job now is to authenticate the client with the token review API to do the subject access review for the, you know, to, to make sure that the snapshots are valid, uh, the client has access to the snapshots concern. And then do the usual translate of the IDs and proxy the gRPC call. So much less moving parts. That entire manager piece is gone, right? Or it's only the sidecar to be deployed uh, with the um, SPE service. But, but something's uh, still missing. What right? is? Uh, 
how, where is the decision of whether or not to grant the access? Like, okay. like under what circumstances do you say, no, you can't have a token? You mean in this one? It's, sorry, in the beginning? The, the, that is that is up to Kubernetes, right? You obtain- well, but, but I mean, so 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 when, when an administrator installs one of these things, there needs to be an affirmative action where they say, I want this application that I'm installing to be able to call these APIs so that in case some attacker comes along, and just tries to call the same APIs, like they get denied. And okay. this thing doesn't- let, let me jump ahead rapidly okay. to what you talk about over here, right? So uh, the CSI driver definitely needs to get permission set up to do the, the authentication pieces. I was looking, but did not find, doesn't mean my search was correct. There is something, um, maybe the app, every Kubernetes service account automatically has the ability to get a token Right, I haven't f figured that part out yet, but there yeah, are. But my my worry is that everyone can get a token, and we have to have some sort of role binding that uh, binds an identity to say like this guy is allowed. No, to no, get no, this it doesn't identity. work that way. Anyone can get a token, but it does but where you use the token and where the token is honored is what controls it. The gatekeeping, okay, okay. The gatekeeping is done in the token review. Okay. So, but what is that? What is what is checked there? Is it a role binding? Yeah. yeah. Let, let, let me go through. You know, just a few slides, and then and then I'll be, uh, let's then we'll dive in. Okay. okay. Let's share, you know we we'll put that in the question in the parking lot so we can trash it out. <clears throat> okay. So to, just to go over, there's the three phases of this thing. There's a client setup phase where it gets where it gets the token. There's the authentication and authorization phase where the sidecar validates that token on the gRPC call and. Then as before, right, the proxy gRPC stuff happens. Okay, so a little bit clearer now, uh, zoom in a bit. Uh, so essentially what the client will have to do is it has to look up the volume snapshot and volume snapshot content objects to get the CSI driver name. You know, at this point, the backup client by actually doing this is, you know, has basically has to have permission on its own to look at these objects, which is cool. Uh, then, before this used to be done by the manager, but now the backup application has to search for this registry where the uh, CSI driver has advertised its sidecar, right? And this, this object is same as before, but it has an, an additional string, which is the audience string. This is typically the DNS name, right, of the service, but we could choose anything we wanted to, right? It's so we, we, we have an audience string out there. Um, then, the, the backup app will then make a token request call uh, and it will provide in that uh, body, right, the audience string. And, uh, you know, it could be, and whatever other optional parameters like expiration or if it's, if it's uh, uh, done indirectly by a projected, you know, service volume in a pod, it will be bound automatically to that pod, things like that. So the validity of this token can be also set at that point. So the token which comes back, right, is an audience scope token. It's, I believe it's a JWT, right? And it contains in it the user information which would be needed later on for a SAR. Okay. Then the client, of course, will trust the CA certificate as before, uh, which now enables it to make the RPC call, the gRPC call. And the gRPC call, uh, we, we instead of that session token we used to have before, we'll provide this audience scope token. We did not have the snapshot namespace before, but we have to provide it now because there's no context involved. Uh, so this call comes into the sidecar and the sidecar will do a token review. The token review takes that uh, audience scope token from the RPC call and the sidecar knows its own audience string. How does it know it? It was configured that way. It, you know, whatever, whatever uh, registry information was there, it, it knows that same thing. So it knows its audience string. So it makes a token review call and the uh, it sends it to the Kubernetes API server, which whatever, however it, it, it works under the covers, right? We'll, we'll decrypt that JWT and make sure that the audience string, uh, right, matches uh, over here. And it'll come back with authenticator is true and it will return the user info of that client. That's crucial. Now, the, the sidecar itself needs permission to be able to make this token review call. And that's, that's something which you have scoped in a later slide that I just flashed early on. Uh, so now the sidecar now has the user info. So now it can turn around and do a subject access, whoops, 
subject access review, right? Which you know, which is the call we were doing before on the webhook. So now we can do a subject access review to check that the, the caller has access to the volume snapshots in that namespace. Uh, if that comes back with true, right, then we can proceed as before, you know, and do all the other stuff, which was load the volume snapshots, the contents, get the IDs, validate existence, et cetera, and then proxy the gRPC call. So it's actually a much simpler solution, less moving parts than before, and definitely easier to deploy. Can, can you go back? I, I just want to understand that last part. What, what is the subject action view, access review actually looking at to, to decide yes or no? Uh, the subject, the, there's a section called resource attributes where, uh, where you specify uh, the uh, resource types um, uh, involved. Is uh, Prasad on the call? He can probably give us details. Yeah, yeah. Prasad, you want to chime in? Yeah, so with subject access review, we are taking the uh, the client uh, which identities you know we got uh, identity by token review request so if the client has access to uh, certain resources um, for certain verbs right so you have to mention the resource types as well as verbs like if, if they have they have access to gate create uh, list uh, the resources right mm -hmm. so we will be checking if uh, the client has access to one snapshots and uh, um, yeah, and volume snapshot content, you know, to uh, to able to get the metadata. Yeah, and in the specified namespace too. I think you can control namespace access, right? You can look okay, for so, namespace access. So what it I'm hearing also, is, it, sorry, Ben, you can also control like uh, access to like the URL. You can essentially say like this token. Uh, it only works for this URL. So I think like um, to your earlier questions, right? So essentially there are two or three things that help to safeguard the, um, the I guess the authentication and authorization of the token. So as Carl pointed out, anyone can request any token, right? From the Kubernetes API server and it's bound to like the service account. And then the interesting thing there is like um, the audience, it's like a, a, has to match on both like um, the backup client side as well as like a CSI driver side. Okay. But that's and not that, a secret, that's just a string. Yeah, it's just a string. So there's one, one layer of it. And then the second layer of it is obviously the RBAC here that we're talking about, right? And then the okay. RBAC, like uh, I think we, um, in one of our earlier prototypes from last year, like uh, we discovered that not only can it authorize like access um, to objects or resources like volume snapshot, you can also like um, safeguard like um, URL as like uh, I think something that they call it non-resource, non non something resource, non URL resource or something like that. Yeah, non-resource URLs. Yeah. And one last thing that we haven't fully is um research into is like token request actually allow you to say like this token is bound to an this certain object. Yeah. Like so it could be like um uh you know like uh, where was it? there was a I think Carl pointed it out somewhere there was like an object uh reference bound reference somewhere inside the token request yeah. um yeah uh api so right yeah. there yeah like um so that one there you see like the that yeah so that is something that we will re have to research into like can we say that okay this token only works for this particular uh volume snapshot or, or whatever like um no 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 you it would CRD. it's fun. it's an existential uh thing it's really it, it helps control the duration of that token so essentially, you know, uh, if I have my backup app and I'm launching a pod to do this stuff, I would bind that token to that pod. And Kubernetes can do it automatically with a projected volume, right? So essentially what happens is when, when you do the review request and you have a bound object, the kubelet makes sure that the bound object is still in existence. If the bound object has gone out of existence, then it denies the token, regardless of the expiry time. Okay. But, but but what I'm what I'm hearing is any Kubernetes user that's able to read volume snapshots and volume snapshot contents and can guess the audience name can go through this process of creating it, constructing a token and obtaining the, the URL and authenticating to it and getting granted access to this API. Because yes. all it's going to check at the end of the day is you have a token that anyone could get, you have an audience name that anyone can guess, and you have access to read a few objects that probably lots of things have access to read, right? Uh, yes. Just to add one more thing. Um, so 
obviously as Khan mentioned, there are a couple of two main ways to generate the token. One is using the token request API and another way is to, you know, while creating a pod, we can project, we can uh, inject the token into the uh, the pod space using project projected field. Uh, for the first method, if you want to create the token using token request API, uh, we have to give the permission to this resource. So service account token uh, sub resource uh, through the RBAC rules, obviously. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so I think I for the second approach for yes. so a projected saying... token, um, yes, a certain for projected token, I think it's up to the who is creating the pod might need the access, but I, I need to verify that. Yeah, and Ben points out one more thing. You know, so so far I haven't we haven't looked at whether we want to control access to the snapshot metadata service, independent of access to the volume snapshot object. So yes, but Ben, you're right. So we could have another permission defined, which this backup service app has to get, right? Okay, and yeah. So we, we can I, check. I just that. wanted to say, like, this is a fantastic improvement. I, I'm I'm really happy with this as opposed to the old design where we were basically rolling our own security. This seems way better. This is yes. I just I really think there has to be an affirmative step so, that someone takes as part of the installation that says this service account should be able to call this API. And I'm yes. granting that access, and then and if you don't do that, it just doesn't work. Yeah. Like, oh, well, do we do we need that? So, what's mm -hmm. what's the equivalent operation would be creating a volume from a volume snapshot, right? Yeah. So can we check and see if they have permission? I mean, what what permissions do we need to do to do that? The the, the worry is that something that is only supposed to be able to like look at some snapshots now has access to call this API and like launch a denial of service attack on the um, on the snapshot differencing endpoint right so s someone who is only supposed I mean, to be able to do do some simple things with snapshots is now granted access to this API that they shouldn't and they could go bananas and attack it you know I mean that's that's a you know but they, it could also be a bug in the software that goes bananas as well so yeah yeah, yeah. I mean there, there's lots I mean, of you know denial of service is usually something we have to deal with on the server side so 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 I just I think that there has to be some role binding where you specifically say hey I'm installing a backup application <laughs> I'm granting the backup application the access to this backup API so that other things don't by default get access to the backup API that, that's all well, I'm saying I think that's fair. but I mean in, in but not but in terms of like you know going bananas we can start creating PVCs like mad right so what's what's our equivalent permission for creating a volume from a volume snapshot I, I'm, well, I'm I don't remember so 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 you're protected by quotas and billing in that case right in a lot but of also cases, there's a, a there's a limitation case. right I mean so so our so from a security point of view, we're actually really concerned with can you get data out that gives you you know information about what's stored. I don't think the CBT is especially sensitive, but you never know. There's always these side channel attacks and junk like that. But if you could read the actually read the data by creating a volume from the volume snapshot, then I don't have a big concern about you being able to get the CBT. So can the, the basic rule is you have to be in the same namespace. As the snapshot, and you have to be able to access the namespace. So yeah, if you can access this this namespace where the snapshot is. You can create a volume from it, and and the the namespace is, is your security model for 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 that kind of data. The, so the, the, the concern yeah. here is you have an infrastructure component that can see all of the snapshots. Um, yes. and it can it can reach around behind and and uh, attack this component. But it can so, also create new new volumes from the snapshots, right? Yeah, it could it could thoroughly well, only, only the the system and making a lot of volumes. So so that would be the, the question then. So what would we do that limits you? So it seems like if we limit people to the same level of access as you get for creating volumes from snapshots, that's equivalent security. Does that make sense? Um No, I mean, I, I'm I'm not thinking about this in terms of end users using the system. I'm thinking about this in terms of infrastructure components that are providing infrastructure for data management. I mean, denial of yeah, I know, but though you know, so denial of service is one thing, right? 
but we've got to defend against that anyway because bugs yeah. right quote is it said i mean you know bugs are just as likely or more likely than a denial of service attack is it's like yeah you denied people the ability to do backups so I we mean, need to defend against it anyway but 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 i'm saying like i'm not asking for something expensive like a, a <clears throat> just adding a role binding somewhere that you have to explicitly grant before this thing will open up the api to you should be very very lightweight yeah and it costs <clears throat> us nothing and it gives you an extra layer of security it, so, but we don't do that role binding for other things if you just want to be able to you know no 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 access... like, like when, when you install a new csi driver as part of that, like you create a bunch of service accounts and you give the sidecars access to all kinds of Kubernetes resources and people scrutinize the list of resources that the CSI driver has access to very closely and says, you know, obviously CSI drivers need to be able to read PVCs and they need to be able to write PVs. But like the moment a CSI driver is like reading the pods, people say, that's weird. Why would a CSI driver ever need to look at a pod? You know, and, and so people look at what infrastructure components have access to and and basically what the, the proposal as stands says we're basically piggybacking on the ability to read volume snapshots and volume snapshot contents and if you can do those you also get this other ability for free and i'm saying let's not make it you know implicit let's make it explicit that you grant access to the the cbt api you know when you create that service account it's just another one of your many role bindings <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I, I see that there is this arrow here, right? We have this uh, snapshot metadata service. We have this uh, get list. Ah, this, yeah. is, this is the public object, non namespaced. I think anybody can look it up. I, I mean, yeah, you could control it through that, Shin, but I think that's uh, since the non, this is a global object. Um, yeah, you could control it through that. But, uh, are, are you, Ben, asking for another one that is for the namespaced uh, object? No, I, I'm suggesting that we use one of those uh, non-resource URL uh, things in the role binding, so that when you, or sorry, in the in the role, this or the this would actually be a cluster role. You'd have a cluster role that says, you know, may call the CBT API, and then when you create the service account that the backup application runs as, you just bind it to that cluster role, and boom, now it has access, and when that when that subject access review occurs, the thing it looks at is, do you, are you bound to a role that has, you know, CVT API in it? And if no, it, it says you're not getting in, right? Just, just to have an explicit handle that says, these are the service accounts that may call this API, and these are the service accounts that may not call this API, so that you know, and you can have a, you have a point of control. Okay. Uh, so, all right, so we look into that, uh, so what Shin just mentioned, uh, access to the snapshot metadata service. So far, we had just thought about it as a globally accessible object. But if that was all, if that was controlled, wouldn't that serve the same purpose? Yeah, but, but think that should be right. Have access yeah. to it, right? Uh, no, no, that's up to us, right? Well, it's up to the cluster administrator. Like that. I that's... mean, always it's always up to the cluster administrator. So right. So we we get to make a recommendation around by default should should people be able to access this or not um but but i i still think no, no matter how many of these we have there needs to be one that says you're allowed to call the cbt api as a as an okay. individual all right so the concept of using a non-resource url is kind of interesting right prasad uh any take on that you're very familiar with these apis uh yeah about using non-resource URL uh, in in the rules and rules rule bind sorry in the rules and rule bindings uh, the only issue I see is um, if you have fixed service URL uh, that would work um, yeah if, it, you know, if the URL changes is it validated sorry? or can it be any arbitrary string which is what's checked for later on. Uh, it has, no, it has so to be the path to the URL, it. right? I don't no, think that's going to yeah, change. If it has to be the actual URL, then then it won't work. We need then it will not work. Else. Yes. Yeah. Well, like is like sorry, just to confirm though, it's not. I don't think you need the entire like um the DNS name plus the prefix and all those things, right? It's just the 
the the the, the prefix or the sub path that points to the API, isn't it? Yeah. So host name basically, right? Yeah. Um, which one is it? It's in the authentication. It's under our back. Uh, it won't be under. Um, it will be maybe just roles and for... cluster roles, right? Yeah. And then. So search for non-resource URL or something. Or just non-resource URL. Let's see it. It there is like rules dot um non-resource URL. It's a partial URL that the user should have access to. Stars are allowed. Billing is the full final step of the path since non-resource URLs are not namespace. Yeah. It has to be a cluster role binding. It can be a role binding. That, that's fine because we want oh. this to be cluster wide. Yeah. Uh, then again, I mean, it, it could be it could be that we require that it has access to the. I mean, the URL doesn't have to exist, right? It's just a name. If it gets through, if it's got, if we are doing the token access, the token review. Uh, sorry, the SAR. We could be looking for anything over here which matches something, right? So it's up to us how we control it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, again, my high level point is like administrators will want a way to control this. Yes. We need to give them yes. something. <laughs> yes, that, that I get. Yeah, and, and actually, in the previous proposal, we had access to the creation of that session object that was equivalent to what you're just saying. So, yes, yes, exactly. If there's some special object which the granting of access to it lets you do this and nothing else, then yeah. like that, then it would serve the purpose. I'm yeah. just worried that if we piggyback on existing objects, then things that happen to have access to those objects will implicitly pick up this new permission. Yeah. And that's bad. Yeah. So do, do these objects actually have to exist? I mean, what if we have, I mean, we have an API group for ourselves, right? And that, and that's the, whatever we defined over here. Um, would we actually, uh, I mean, what, what was our, we have CBT storage, right? CBT.storage at Kate's IO, right? V1 alpha, et cetera. So what if we had that API group and we had a resource called mm -hmm. snapshot metadata session, right? Snapshot metadata API or session or whatever. And it doesn't exist, but it, but it is a, a, a resource name. And we're looking for a create verb, which is pretty much similar to what, you know, what, how you set up permissions for token request and token review, right? You just use these names, but these don't actually exist in etcd or anything. Would that work? Prasad, it's something worth trying. What do you think? Or we can ask Sagoth about that. Mm -hmm. What's the so Carl, what's the purpose of creating a RBAC that the resource don't exist? Or essentially like I guess a virtual resource? Or well, then the, it's a very well, then it's it's well scoped because for one thing we'd use our, our API uh, group, right? It's not an arbitrary thing. We use our API group. We'll, you know, we'll specify the a resource, a pseudo resource which represents what we're trying, which is you know access to this snapshot metadata service, and the verb is create. That's it. Which is not unlike you know token uh, the getting permission but, for token review or token access uh, token request. I think the verb should be get, but but yeah, it, it doesn't matter <laughs> as long as as long as the system would support that. I, that would be a good solution. Yeah, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. The the in these cases, right? They use create for all these things. So what? Yeah, whatever. It's some verb. <laughs> we'll just we'll figure it out. Yeah. But if we can try, if we can get, if that works, right, and we can get it uh, cross check with Sigoth, right? That would be. I think that would be a good point. What do you say, Prasad? Yeah, uh, it also makes sense to use non resource URLs. Um, in okay. my opinion. All right. So that administrator would know which APIs uh, the backup client would call and whether they want to give access to that API or not. So how would we name our gRPC API? That's my problem. Um, it, yeah, it could be, we can even use star or any wildcard that is allowed. Yeah, well. I mean, With common critics. Okay, let me, like let me put this, I'd like, I'd like, I'd like the rule to be able to identify it, that it's CBT snapshot metadata related. Okay, so 
I was just hanging on to that uh, particular noun we saw over here. Yeah, it, it, it should be clear to an administrator reviewing his cluster roles, like what it means when he know, when he sees this in a cluster role. Yeah. Uh, and, and aside from that, I don't I don't yeah. think it really matters. You know, as long as there's an explicit line in your cluster role that granted you access, and that's the thing that the subject access review is looking at. Yeah. Then the administrators I, will know what to revoke if they want to revoke access. Yeah, I think we should also look into the the fact. You know, Shin had mentioned why why wouldn't access to this object be equivalent? I think it's equivalent, right? But uh, you know, and that's actually a little bit clearer than a non URL. Uh, sorry, a non resource URL. Yeah, I, mean, I I would be okay with that. It would say get access on the snapshot metadata service implicitly grants access to this because why would you be talking to this or why would you be getting snapshot metadata services right. unless you needed access i mean I, i'm sure i'll be proven wrong by some edge case but it, that that feels closer to a good yes. solution yes yeah we, we look into that definitely yes thank you but and, yeah, and that, that was it so for the update essential, sorry there's still essentially two different things right the metadata service is a resource. The URL that you're trying to protect is a different, I guess, resource. No, is it? I mean, this is yeah. representative, right? This is representative of any snapshot metadata service. Is that a valid assumption to say, oh, I once I get access to this resource, I'll get access to another URL? Because this resource, snapshot metadata, in the, in the, it, it's translate to a, a URL of its own, right? Like slash API. No, no, this is, this is a permission. D1 snapshot metadata service. Isn't this a permission? The URL is a different thing. This is a permission that gives us the ability to uh, look up, to make this call to list, right? To, right, to, to list the object, right? So behind the scene, this object, snapshot metadata service, it, it maps to its own URL, right? Like in the in the Kubernetes, like, but, um, you know. That's right, but um, it's a class. Finding. But it's a class. I mean, really, the application doesn't know where the volumes are going to be, right? The volumes are, the application is granted access to, to volumes, uh, volume snapshots and volume snapshot con uh, contents, but volume snapshots in the namespace, not volume snapshots of this particular CSI provisioner in that namespace. It's volume snapshots right. in that namespace. So likewise- the, the, the point Ivan's making is finer grained is better, right? This We're, we're doing something coarse grained by proposing that. A finer grained one would be would be an improvement if, if it's possible. <clears throat> yeah, like, um, I guess I just don't see like the need to force the assumptions that, hey, if you get, you have permissions to snapshot metadata service resource and its URL, it also means you have um, access to like um, the CBT uh, URL. Um, I just don't think like that assumption but needs to be. This forced. object represents the service. I mean, how much how much more precise can you get? Now I agree it's not on a per per object basis. It's it's a class of objects, right? It's a, it's the type. But so call, what, what's the concern with using the non-resource URL RBAC? Okay, no concern other than can we can we string in make it very clear by stringing in all these nouns, right, of some sort, what we're talking about. Yeah, I, I think we should experiment here and come back with the proposal. Um, I don't think this is going to be a hard problem to solve. No. But uh, we yeah. just we, we don't have all the information in front of us, so I think we're we're speculating and arguing about stuff we don't know. Right. <laughs> so yeah. So sorry. Uh, uh, so one other question, um, Carl. So as far as I can tell, like if the uh, going back to that bound object reference um, thing that we talked about. So um, so sorry. Go back to your slide deck. I think that one thing that we are missing. Uh -huh. when we move to this token review or token request API is that we don't have a way compared to like the previous um, session mm -hmm. proposal. Like one thing that we, we lose out is that we, we are not able to say, hey, this token only works for this session with these two pair of, this pair of snapshots, right? No, we've so accomplished this... that. We've accomplished that. I mean, I mean, there's nothing on the back end that says, ah, oh. Ah, I see, I see. That, yeah, but you know, that was an artifact. That was an artifact of, um, how we did the session because we had to enumerate 
the objects so that the session could find out. Otherwise, you know, the creator could, could reference some objects in the request and then do some other set of objects in, in the actual gRPC. So we had to qualify that. That, but that is an artifact of our solution, which we had to do to make sure consistency was accomplished. Now, right, there is no session set up. So the first time we ever see, the first time we ever see the request, right, it's got all, it's got its entire payload and that's it. But, right, so essentially on the CSI driver side, all we can do is like, we got a token and then we say, okay, this token is authorized to access all these resources and all these, um, right. URL or whatever, right. but right. there's nothing, you know, to say that this session on uh, this token only works for this. And I guess session because the, you know in the past again we have a yes, more yes, we don't richer have a way to represent it. Exactly, we, we, we don't. Yeah, which is not I, the end of the world, I guess. It, it's not, point. and we will still be doing this. So the at least the existential check will be done, right? We'll be looking up the object. You can't reference some arbitrary thing which doesn't exist. Stuff like that. We'll still be doing that. Right, right. The, the most we can do is that like, we can say this token can get and list like volume snapshots and volume snapshot contents. There's nothing that says like uh, only this pair of volume snapshot and only this pair of volume snapshot content, or at least on the CSI driver side. Yeah, yeah. Which I don't know if it is a big deal at this point. At least like there's some form of um, uh, authorization right at the back end. I think one of the things that like, um, the risk of um sounding like um a bit like oversimplifying things, I think um, because security itself, as we all pointed out, many many times, such a big thing. Like I wonder at what point can we just say okay for B one alpha one of the first phase of this cap, we just say we have all the essential Kubernetes security things in place, and then like if needed, we can come back with a second cap that say this is how we harden it further with more specific edge cases in mind? Because right now we're just exploring potential edge, edge cases. You know, I think that's what well, the like, phase is about, where people will try it out and come back with feedback, right? It, it, can you describe the, 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 the realistic use case for a backup application that, that can only run CVT on some subset of the possible snapshots? Like, I, I, I feel like, a backup application needs access to everything to do its job. The, 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 the thing I'm concerned about is I think I don't want things that aren't backup applications to be able to call this API. <clears throat> that, that, yeah. That's my concern. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think that's fair. Yeah. Well, I mean, people have, you know, people do run in some environments where they don't get full system privileges and they want to have like backup of just their namespace, for example. So we had people asking for this, you know, that they would want to just install Valero for themselves. Mm. Um, and you could see other things like maybe a replication app yeah. that's replicating the volumes in a particular namespace. So, so couldn't that be accomplished, Dave, by simply uh, giving the backup app uh, a role binding to permissions to the volume snapshot as opposed to a cluster role binding? Probably. I'm just, I think, uh, you know, Ben was kind of like, what, what's the use case for uh, yeah, yeah, a, a yeah, backup app that's not cluster wide? So yeah, if, talk, it, talking about if we think that's a real use it, case, right? then then the ability to, to do vetoes based on the token accessing a namespace is not supposed to see starts to sound useful to me. Right. Essentially, it's like we don't want like a um, tenant in one namespace to request or change block in another namespace, right, based on the volume snapshots. But again, right, like can we, can that just be like a phase two of the cap? Because there seems to be a like harder problem to come up with. And yeah, also yeah, yeah. I, I think if we, if we solve the, the cluster-wide backup problem securely, like that'll be a massive win. And, and this desire to have per namespace backup applications seems a little bizarre to me, but, but maybe we'll entertain it later. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I would say that um, for the security, if we try to tighten it in a in a later version, that tends to cause problems. If we're like adding additional capability, like you know, hey, here's the ability to let users have finer grain. You know, not they don't need cluster 
uh, roles or, you know, cluster permissions to use it. So we're kind of loosening it up, but also, you know, make it finer grain. That's probably something we can pull off. But, you know, something where it's like, oh, you just used to work, but now it doesn't. That's that's usually a harder problem. So but, uh, we don't we don't want to over engineer this part of the solution. I mean, I, I think we've made a huge step forward with this new design. Mm -hmm. um, I, no, I I agree. All, I, all I'm saying is that you know let's not plan to tighten things. Let's make it as tight. We can make it tight at the beginning and then loosen it. So like your proposal that initially yeah, this but, only supports you know we have, backup we have apps with all, all the way through. Like, what does it mean to have a access to only do this in, in one namespace or I'm not, I'm not arguing that we do that that's that's something where we can that's loosening actually so initially we're saying you got to have so if so your proposal was initially we say you got to have basically cluster admin you know very high level of privilege to use this so basically a cluster wide um, permission and that's something that you don't hand out to every application Right, and then we'll give you finer grain controls in the future, which won't break. Like if you already had cluster, um, cluster wide permissions, adding the namespace scoping isn't going to break running applications. Right, they already have permission to do everything anyway. That that's kind of what I'm trying to say. Is that making sense? Yeah, and I, and I think Dave, it's probably already grandfathered in because essentially, if you don't have access to load volume snapshots in a namespace, you can't do this. Right. Well, unless you guess something. Well, the, 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 the problem is the problem is this hypothetical future namespace backup application still needs to read several non namespaced resources to do its job, and it's it's not clear to me um, why how you're going to put a fence around it other than at the subject access review choke point that we just talked about. Right, that's... So in an existing application, I can do a volume snapshot in a namespace. I can create a volume from the snapshot in, in a namespace, and I can read the data from that snapshot in the namespace. Right, but you can't see don't... the volume snapshot content object. It's, it's invisible to you. <clears throat> OK, but and so, so, if you so my hypothetical to... backup application right, right now can do its work by taking a snapshot, cloning the snapshot, attaching the snapshot as a volume, and then reading the data out. Okay, that's an interesting point there, Ben. Uh, you said the volume snapshot content could be invisible. See, the only reason we are saying load the volume snapshot content is to find the CSI driver name. But right, right. But that, that's why I'm saying like this backup application is fundamentally an infrastructure component, the, the way we've designed it. To, to yeah. try to install it as a user application in a user namespace would never work, uh, and and you would have to start granting it cluster wide access to certain resources for right. it to do its job. And the right. moment you do that, the moment you do that, it can see the snapshots in the other namespaces, and it can start doing all kinds of things you no, wouldn't no. want it to do. I, I hear you, but consider this, right? I mean, right now we're just talking about the volume snapshot existing. Most likely, the backup application was the one that created the volume snapshot, right? In which case, it had access to the PV. And from the PV, it could get the provisioner name, the CSI driver name. So in, in other words, it's already got the driver name. So it could just jump, skip this step, right? Just create the snapshot, skip this step about looking up the content and uh, you know go for the metadata service directly. So maybe this is really not about lo looking up the volume you, snapshot you, as much you as- still need, You still need the volume snapshot content to, to extract the, uh, the snapshot handle. Uh, the backup applicate client doesn't need to do that. The backup client has access to volume snapshot. It's 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 uh, this guy right, the sidecar right. It's actually this step over here, which was authorized, can needs to do that. So really, really in this bubble here, the only thing we really need is to get the CSI driver name. So you could get it from the PVE prior to making the volume, before or after making the volume snapshot, or you could look it up from the volume snapshot content. But essentially that that, that uh, box should really say, determine the CSI driver name. That's what it really is about. All right, well, I, I think we need to, we need to make a call whether we think that the per namespace backup application is a real use case, because I do think 
we could back ourselves into a corner where we say we're not going to support it today and then if tomorrow we change our minds yeah. we'll realize we made a decision that that really really causes problems i mean given that volume snapshot is already available Right. This is an optimization for volume snapshot. So you're basically saying, yeah, we have this optimization av available unless, you know, you're not, you're running as a non-privileged application. And what's the logic to that? Sorry, I, I didn't, I didn't follow all that. I'm trying to. So, so right now I can write an app. I mean, backup is not the only use case for volume snapshotting, right? You could be, right. You know, there's a, there's any number of things, and it could even be something like, uh, say, for example, you have an operator that does its own backup. This is something we've talked about, right? Um, right now, it could do that by, say, taking a volume snapshot and then doing a block dump or whatever it does. It, maybe it knows how to read the format or something, whatever it does, right? But it can do currently it can currently use volume snapshot on only its resources, and that's just fine. So why would we add an API that gives you an optimization on volume snapshots, but not make it available to anybody who can use volume snapshots? Well, the, 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 the word use is doing a lot of work in that sentence because what, what an end user can do with the volume snapshot and what an infrastructure component can do with the volume snapshot is a overlapping two two overlapping sets, right? The, 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 um, what what's different right now? So the the ability it's the ability to read the volume snapshot content and get its handle. That that's not a that's not a usage. That's a detail. Right, but but in order to interact with the actual storage device and like do things, you need you need that handle. So like ordinary users don't need that information to do what they need to do because the sidecars do the work for you. The moment you're writing a new infrastructure component that might have to interact with, with the actual So we're, we're, we're adding a, a utility to Kubernetes, basically a, a function, you know, functionality here. Right, so but, but if, my if, current if, functionality if, is I can create a snapshot. Hold on, go to slide 16 or the, the previous, go back a slide or two in the, uh, maybe it was the one before that. Uh, maybe it's the one after that. The, the new sidecar we're adding. Mm -hmm. That's an implementation, right? We're, if you look at it from the top, from the requirements point of view of what you're building, what are we building? Well, the, who's going to ship the sidecar? The sidecar is going to be shipped by the- That's an implementation, storage, Ben. The storage vendor, right? That's an implementation. So what capabilities are we providing and why would we not provide these capabilities along with the existing volume snapshot capability. I guess I need to think through which pieces are likely to be present on any given cluster under different circumstances and whether there's any novel way to put them together that we haven't thought of. Because what we're envisioning here is a, is a cluster with a, a, a storage device that is explicitly supports the CBT API and a back, backup application that explicitly takes advantage of the CVT API and the, the glue between them is that is, is that snapshot metadata object and the, the rest, I'm sorry, the, the GRP, the HTTP GRPC that, that goes between the backup application and the sidecar, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's the glue. Right, but from a functionality, I mean, I, I really want to attack this from a functionality point of view because this is where I, I, I get what you're saying. I, I'm just I'm trying to think like, so so if if we design this with the whole cluster backup use case in mind, and then someone says, "Hey, I've got an idea. I'm going to write one that's namespace specific." Like, can they do that? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Right, or why wouldn't we want them to do that? Because we already give them the access to volume snapshot, you know, create volume from snapshots. Yeah, but it may, maybe, maybe it would just work. Maybe it'd be fine. But but you'd have to change the subject access review to not, not check access to the volume snapshot content, right? Because that's not actually required yeah. to do any of this. Yeah, I think we will do that because it's not required. Like I said, this really means we need the CSI driver name, and that's it. Hmm. 
which is already available. It's not a secret, right? I mean, so that's no, like no, you say, it's, it's in the vault. It's available from two sources, right? The PV or the volume snapshot content. So what we're saying is that the backup app has to have access to either of those two. You know, you get the PV via the PVC, whatever, right? And oh, do you get the PV? Uh, well, no, no. It, you could get that string from the uh, from the storage class or the snapshot class. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. If you, as long as you get it, then you know that's true. Then I'm I'm going to definitely remove this VSC from here because it's not necessary. We really only want the CSI driver name so we can make this search. Okay. Why well, I, I I feel like if 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 it's hypothetically possible to just create a single namespace backup application, then there needs to be a handle somewhere in that subject access review that says, this guy only can access snapshots in this namespace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is exactly what is yeah, being done with SCR. Yeah. And in which case, I, as I said, told Dave, we can do this with the current thing. It works. Okay. Okay. I'm happy. So sorry to go down a deep rabbit hole on that. No, no, no. It surfaced some flaws. I mean, you know, we over. I think I over specified this thing by mentioning VSC in the front. Shouldn't be there, right? So it's good. So anyway, uh, next steps, right? Uh, okay, we'll update the obviously update this stuff, which right. And uh, we're thinking, uh, you know, Prasad's already done some prototyping. Actually, we're almost out of time. Prasad, you want to say what you what you found out? Yeah, I just uh, validated, validated the token request and token review part. Uh, I loved it, the existing end-to-end -end prototype to get it working. So that, that's really cool. So, yes, and we'll, we'll update the design with this uh, with this stuff. So I think we're good. It, 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 you know, I'm actually feeling very positive about it because it simplifies everything and it's definitely, you know, a nicer, more elegant and easier to deploy model. All right, that's all I had. Uh, that's great. Thank, thank you. So we don't have to go back to seek auth, right? We got all the. Concepts. We don't have to go back yes. to them, no. Okay. I think the next time some of them will be involved would be um, at the cap level. Right, when they when they're ready yeah, Jordan, for Kingdom to review, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Jordan, David, it's uh, they they've seen the older PR the, the older cap before. Um, so I okay. assume like um going down the path, they will continue to show some interest in the cat so okay that's good all right um are there any other questions regarding this uh cat and i appreciate you being exhaustive on this it's, it's how we all kind of get to grok it <laughs> my pleasure <laughs> <laughs> all right then thank you so much all right, bye. Hey, thanks everybody. Good discussion. Thank you.